So I wanted to welcome you um, and share a bit of a story about how this all, um, this, this being the competition, um, all kind of came to uh, precipitate it, I guess. Um, I was in a class with John Hale, uh, who's now at um, USC Columbia, um, on last year, uh, last fall, on um, a people's history in Charleston. So it's part of this, uh, as part of this course, we went into the archives over at the Avery Research Center, um, was where I did my research, and I um, was speaking with one of the archivists, and she pointed me to the story of Frank Sturkin. So um, Frank Sturkin was a student from 1947 to 1951, um, a white male student, of course. Uh, this was during the time when College of Charleston was private, became private to avoid desegregation. Um, which, that was, which was just for just over 20 years that um, that, that decision was made. Um, so, so I found it very interesting that he kind of delivered a speech advocating for the desegregation of, of the school um, and, and considering kind of College of Charleston as it functions for the larger Charleston community as a kind of the cultural hub, as somewhere where, um, where society and culture is created in a sense. Um, so, you know, this is going on in my uh, school life, uh, and if you ask a lot of uh, active students on campus, there's, there's a school life and then there's an extracurricular school life, which is still kind of school life. Um, but, you know, at my, in this other realm of my school life, at the same time, um, a student dressed up uh, as Freddie Gray for Halloween, um, which many people remember was um, a very painful experience for many people on our campus. Um, and in the Charleston community. Um, so I so I had this research going on, was was um, kind of invited to uh, listen to the the sessions that Black Student Union was running um, on how we can make our campus better and more inclusive. Um, and I was inspired by by all of those voices, but then also recognizing that um, sometimes we don't. Uh, Sometimes we don't allow kind of students to directly interact with administrators and create kind of policies that reflect the lived everyday experience of being on this campus. Um, so I, you know, this speech competition is born of those two desires to um, to memorialize Frank Sturkin and his story, his bravery, um, but then also um, give students the opportunity to uh, affect change in a kind of a, an, in a wide institutional forum. So, um, so I, you know, I, I was impressed kind of, and, and um, I, you know, I personally was, uh, I felt healed from the restorative justice conversations that happened around the Freddie Gray costume incident um, that came out of kind of student affairs. Um, and, you know, with that, I'm also, I'm excited to see where the, um, where the, kind of commitments that uh, President McConnell made to seeing through with the, um, the student code of conduct revisions, the bias and stem report, um, and the diversity training module. I'm excited to see how that will be um, institutionalized in the um, months and years to come, because I think those are, uh, those are something we need to definitely stand by. And I'm excited to see where the, the President's diversity review board to um, where that report is going and, and where that can um, affect large institutional change. Um, but I still care about kind of um, Sturgeon's own role, um, and and you know, and his kind of at this time following a tradition of other Black student activists out of Avery Normal Institute who were pushing for desegregation as well, um, and and to, to kind of to give to give students the opportunity to do that. Um, so I wanted to share a quote that kind of um, ties a bunch of this together from actually certain speech. This is the College of Charleston the most firmly entrenched stronghold of tradition in the country. Certainly what the student leaders think cannot be unimportant. 
the solid sound has become liquid. So um, as we're reflecting on what, what these students have to say, um, I invite us to uh, consider what it, what it would be like to imagine a radically better campus um, that we're living, that, that, that we can, that we can cre create. Um, yeah, and, they, and there's, there's another, um, another quote from Paulo Freire, who's one of my favorite, um, favorite philosophers and thinkers, um, that I think, um, I think pertains here. So, um, to admit of dehumanization as an historical vocation would lead either to cynicism or total despair. The struggle for humanization, for the emancipation of labor, for the overcoming of alienation, for the affirmation of men and women as persons would be meaningless. This struggle is possible only because dehumanization, although a historical fact, is not the given destiny, but the result of an unjust order. Um, so I invite us to, uh, within our own minds as we're reflecting on these speeches, to invite a change and, and to, uh, to uh, embrace that, embrace that uh, idea of um, always making ourselves better. Um, so, with that, um, I would like to invite up to the stage uh, Patricia Williams Hussain. Um, she has recently been named an Associate Dean of the Libraries, um, as a co principal investigator for the Race and Social Justice Initiative, um, and is the Executive Director for the Avery Research Center for African American History and Culture. Thank you. extremely brief because you want to hear these amazing speeches. Um, I just want to say that I am honored to support the work of Tanner's Vision. Um, it's great to see that the Archibald, the Archibald collections um, at Avery are being utilized by students and professors across campus. Um, I'm happy that the Race and Social Justice Initiative is able to support this program. It, um, helps us extend the mission of RSJI and by extension the work of the Avery Research Center. Um, and also I just want to say that I'm inspired because um, these, this um, uh, Tanner is obviously amazing. Um, and it's, it's great to see that so many students and professors have come out on this Saturday afternoon to support this project. And um, we don't have a whole bunch of money at Avery, but um, when we, we um, see programs that um, are it, that it allow us to, um, you know, to just to show what Avery has and to extend our reach through our campus, we readily support it. Um, and I hope to see many of you next weekend at the Terrace for our free screenings of the Hate You Give, which is a college reads book. Um, and so I think there's six Screenings. Um, there may be a few uh, tickets left. If you do need tickets and you don't have any, see Darren Calhoun, not me. Um, <laughs> um, but hopefully um, we can get you some tickets if you don't already have any. And uh, again, thank you so much. And this is this is Tanner's baby, his dream. This is awesome. Um, okay, so uh, I we're now going to hear from other students. Um, so I have I randomly selected an order. So um, first, we're going to be hearing from Jordan. Um, Jordan goes by she or her pronouns. So um, thank you, Jordan. lined up and down King Street, the Arthur Revenel Bridge overlooking the scintillating harbor, the vibrant colors of Rainbow Row, the 
infamous historical cobblestone that surrounds the equally historical steps leading up to each building. You see, as beautiful as these cobblestone streets and winding stairs are, they unintentionally tend to leave, leave out a large part of our great Charleston community. I've seen many people, college students, elderly neighbors, and even children bound to wheelchairs, walkers, and crutches that struggle to get around town on the uneven cobblestone and up and down steps. For some, limited mobility is only temporary. For others, it's a lifelong sentence. Regardless of how severe or how long a Charlestonian has to deal with being physically handicapped is beside the point. Every Charlestonian should feel at ease in their community and should not have to struggle to function in the city life. I've noticed as I have wandered about campus in the city that many building entrances lack ramps as an alternative to stairs for those who use wheelchairs and walkers. The buildings that have ramps available require a separate entrance, generally out of the way of a normal route over, thus requiring more time and effort to arrive to the destination. If one has to travel further to get to a handicapped friendly entrance, then it defeats the purpose of having that said entrance. Some of the bigger problems arise inside the buildings. Sure, most have elevators, but what happens in the case of a fire? It's a no warning that you should never use an elevator during a fire. So what does that leave us with? The stairs? The crowded stairs already full with mobs of people rushing to escape the building? It's hard enough for someone who is physically handicapped to get up and down these steps. This not only makes for a strenuous situation, but it also makes for a dangerous one. Those who have to navigate their way down several flights of steps whilst in a wheelchair are likely to take more time to escape and thus, be sub and thus may be subject to getting trapped. Why should one group's safety be put into jeopardy just because they get around differently than others? These people are not lesser than any of the rest of us, though sometimes they are treated that way. Almost every single physically handicapped citizen can function in daily life on their own, but when the city fails to provide them with the resources they need, they then have to rely on the help of others to get around, which can create a sort of barrier between each other. Though the physically handicapped are in no way, shape, or form lesser than those who are not, Having to rely on the help of others can make it seem like it. For an ideal setup around town, each building should have a ramp option for each set of stairs there are, both indoors and outdoors. Perhaps a simple construction of a smooth pathway on each set of steps would be enough for every individual to easily get around. And in terms of indoors, each set of steps would include a chairlift. Regarding the uneven cobblestone pathways, perhaps a smooth sidewalk parallel to the street would work out. The concern that many people might bring up concerning the construction of these ramps is that they could potentially interrupt the historical infrastructure of the city of Charleston. The ideal ramps and sidewalks we build around town would not interfere or destroy Charleston's historical land. Instead, these ramps should be built alongside, not in place of, or covering up these historical pieces of Charleston. Another concern that may come to mind are the expenses of making the area a more inclusive and safer space for every citizen and resident. Sure, the construction of new ramps, sidewalks, and stair lifts would cost a few extra bills, but it would be for the equality and well-being of those unrecognized by the community. A chairlift costs between one and two grand, and the construction of a ramp can cost as little as $100, depending on the material. There are several options and ways to pay for such projects. The first way would be to have a campus-wide fundraising event in order to help pay for the construction of these needed entities. Perhaps a formal ball or series of movie nights would attract many students and could thus raise a lot of funds. We could easily take these ideas up with the College of Charleston Student Government Association. The second way to gain these funds is to speak with the mayor of Charleston, as well as any other locally known figures, in order to request, request grants to make these changes happen. If we emphasize the fact that our sense of equality is at stake here, 
we'd be likely to gain subsidies. As a college and as a community, we should do everything in our power to make sure each and every resident is equally represented in our society. Those who get around town either with the aid of a wheelchair, walker, cane, or set of crutches are the same as those who don't. The only difference between them is the method of mobility. We should make sure that each method is possible to ensure safety, equality, and independence for those who aren't able to walk. It's difficult enough to be forced to function with the aid of a physical device, risking the judgment of others. The least we can do is make it that much easier for them to get around out in the beautiful city of Charleston. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan, for that. Um, very insightful. Um, <clears throat> okay, um, okay uh, next I'd like to invite up Taylor Bowes. Um, and Taylor goes by she, her pronouns. students will be sexually assaulted or raped during their time in college. The issue of campus assault and campus sexual assault and rape is pervasive and permeates across a wide variety of the student population. As a diverse community, CFC's 2014 climate report revealed that the populations most affected by this issue were female, the LGBTQ students, students with disabilities, and students identifying as transgender, genderqueer, and non-conforming. For survivors of sexual violence, what should be an exciting milestone in the college experience becomes instead littered with memories of violence and deeply rooted emotional trauma. As a survivor of sexual violence myself, I can speak to the effects that this has for the duration of the rest of your life. Victims, play, victims face victim blaming, harassment, and other awful things that society allows. Rape culture makes the dehumanization of one person to another normal and allows sexual violence to become mundane something that's inevitable. By providing a foundation for the normalization of sexual violence, it allows sexual assault and rape to be excused under notions like boys will be boys. Universities must now more than ever acknowledge rape culture as a real problem, worthy of addressing and eliminating the predatory environment that it creates and College of Charleston is no exception. At my previous university, where I experienced a sexual assault, I was not alone. And I'm proposing that an organization started by a friend who has similar experiences, called the Sisterhood of the Traveling Panties, be established here. My idea for the organization is that it will address more than just women as victims of sexual assault, perhaps instilling chapters that could represent other communities that are affected. The original hope for the organization was that it would influence a whole campus, if not many campuses, and I believe that this is the start. The goal is to bring an end to rape culture 
and it's about time you do so. By empowering and giving voices back to the victims of sexual assault, the organization can bring a change. The organization was extremely successful at Winthrop University. It began with five members in January, and by the end of spring semester, at 25. Growth can be attributed to their active promotion, speaking at events, posting flyers, and word of mouth, which I intend to do here. The organization's success can be seen by the effect it has on the community. People began speaking up, standing up for what was right. And this is a success because it impacted just one person, and that's really the goal. The hopes for the future of this organization is that it could go national, that it could affect many other people, and I believe that that can start here. The organization can bring an end to the rape culture that so pervasively permeates across college campuses in our nation. The issue needs addressing, and I think now is the time. Thank you for that, Taylor. Um, okay, next we're going to hear from Sophie Bale. Um, Sophie goes by she, her pronouns. I'll start with some words from Frank Sturka. I can't say exactly when I saw the light, nor do I know its source. But the important thing is that I did. The difference between Frank and I is that I do know the source of the light. When I was 17, I was accepted early decision into the Honors College at CFC. I had a full ride and my future looked bright. A year later, I had a 1.2 GPA and had been kicked out of college entirely. My mom cut me off, I was living in a trailer park, and I felt I had no opportunities and no future. My life was a dark, chaotic mess, and I couldn't see a way out. Then one day, my brother gave me a bicycle, a rusty old Schwinn. I used that bike to get a job to save up money so I could move back downtown and enroll in the Trident Tech. Step by step, pedal by pedal, I began to move forward. I was readmitted to CFC and made the Dean's List every single semester until I graduated. I relied on my bike all the while to get to work, school, errands, everything. Now I'm a graduate student here and I work for a bike-centric nonprofit. I can't imagine anything more fitting for me. I don't have that rusty Schwinn anymore, but I have something else. I have a light to find my way out of the darkness. I have self-empowerment. When used as a primary mode of transportation, are the intertwining link between resilient social, economic, and environmental adaption. They are instruments of social justice and they revolutionize mobility. They solve transportation woes while providing economic freedom and environmental and physical health benefits. A better bicycling initiative would allow the college to achieve our sustainability, literacy, quality enhancement project goals while creating meaningful social change in the college community and in Charleston. The cost of living in Charleston has skyrocketed. As rents in increase, the availability of affordable housing decreases. This makes it nearly impossible for students, especially those who come from low-income families, to afford attending our college. Students are forced to live further and further away from campus, a reality that I know too well. In 2011, I paid $400 to live four blocks from campus. Seven years later, I pay $700 a month, and I live over two miles from campus. Fortunately, I already feel comfortable on my bike and using it to commute this distance. I was able to grow into it gradually and was taught by people in the area who know the ropes. I know how to combine transit modes and put my bike on the bus for free with my Cougar card to get around the greater Charleston area. But this is not the case for most students, especially freshmen and transfer students. 
getting to campus can seem like an expensive and insurmountable problem. While the college may not be able to do anything about the cost of living in Charleston, there is an answer, and it has two wheels, not four. If students can avoid the expenses incurred by owning a car and parking downtown, they can save $3,500 per academic year or $14,000 for four years. And that calculation was made with a paid off used car and the least expensive parking pass options in the college at $300 a semester. According to Times, oh, now let's subtract two wheels from four and see the savings. According to Times and Forbes magazine, the initial investment for a decent used commuting bike, including maintenance and all the necessary safety accessories and gear, is $500 to $1,100. Learn to maintain it yourself, and then you're looking at a cost of less than $100 a year after your initial investment. If a student chooses to rely on a bicycle instead of a car for all four years, that's a savings of close to $13,000. These are figures I can personally vouch for after living downtown and using a bike for transportation for the past 10 years. Our economic and social diversity at the college is under a microscope right now and has been for the last few years. And I fear we are at risk of embarrassing ourselves when we could be embracing this opportunity to move to the forefront of sustainable humanitarianism in higher education. We all know that a significant portion of students at this school are highly privileged and can afford the cost of living here. But the college needs diversity to thrive, just like the natural world. But the structural reality of this school militates against the inclusion of individuals from marginalized and minoritized groups. Our diversity statistics prove this reality. Data collected by the college's Office of Institutional Research Planning and Information Management reflects that the percentage of undergraduates who identify as African American or Hispanic has only increased 4% in the last 20 years. Whatever the college is doing to attract diverse students, it is simply not working. Now you may, ask, may be asking how this problem can be solved with bikes. Allow me to explain. As Charleston changes, so do the needs and demands of the students. The Office of Sustainability has seen a steady increase in use of the bike share program since its inception in 2013. 2014, I hosted a well-attended campus bike fair. This past summer, I was invited to lead a bike workshop for their interns, and now as a graduate student, I've become fully aware of the continuous growth in student interest and need for bicycle resources at the college. While the Office of Sustainability has some tools and have hosted a couple fix-it-yourself opportunities without assistance or instruction, they are not equipped to meet the full demands and need of bike education here, especially with their myriad of other commitments. However, the Office of Sustainability fully supports this proposal and is an obvious partner for the Better Bicycling Initiative. The School of Education, Health, and Human Performance is another logical partner, as this would expand their physical education offerings. So what does the college provide right now to encourage and support bike commuting? It seems that the college wants to support it, but doesn't know how. The college's bicycle operations and parking policy is not easily found and digestible. Uh, there is a bicycle routes map available on CFC's website, but it's inaccurate and truly lacks detail. Fortunately, there are much more resor uh, useful resources available from the People Pedal Plan maps created by the City and Charleston Moves to the educational print and video safety resources from organizations like Palmetto Cycling Coalition and the League of American Bicycles. But our students don't have easy access to these, and more importantly than that, they don't know that they need to educate themselves. So they don't. And so the students with bikes just ride cluelessly, unaware of the rights and responsibilities that they have. Well, we wouldn't allow this with any other vehicle, would we? There aren't any college students driving cars, motorcycles, or even mopeds who don't have driver's, license, driver's licenses or proven knowledge of operational safety. So why do we allow it with bikes? Now here's our solution. I ask you, imagine a bicycle. It can't move forward without two wheels. The two wheels of the Better Bicycling Initiative are a course and a student-run cooperative. The course, ideally a first-year seminar, would encourage active participation from students and teach them bicycle safety, maintenance and basic repair, as well as best commuting practices while riding. The other wheel, the student-run bicycle co-op, students could practice their skills while sharing knowledge with others. Students from other departments could participate in the co-op as well and learn business management, finance, and marketing. This co-op would benefit the entire college community. If this sounds like a strange idea to you, think again. 182 schools across 45 states have achieved BFU, or Bicycle Friendly University status. Clemson, USC, and even Coastal Carolina have surpassed us. 
We cannot continue to ignore our peers who are marginalized by society and history. So many of these students, my friends and yours, are truly passionate about their education and trust that it will make all the difference in their lives. The self-empowerment and upward mobility provided by higher education is an opportunity we must make accessible to all despite the challenges. It is time that we unite to institutionalize equity and fair distribution of opportunity. The CFC Better Bicycling Initiative will attract and support a student body that is more diverse economically and socially. We must let current and potential students know that it can be viable for them to live in Charleston and to attend this college. CFC can be more than a beautiful historic campus. We can also be a leader in intersectional growth in environmental, social, and economic facets of sustainable literacy. With college students making up a third of the residents in the downtown area, Charleston needs this too. A vibrant, inclusive, and sustainable future awaits us. Thank you. Thank you for that, Sophie. Um, up next, we have Jake Brown, and Jake goes by uh, he, him pronouns. Get notified, 
we get notified if there's a scholarship or about a sporting event, so why can't we get notified about a grant that is made to support the students at the school? Why can't we talk about an issue that is so prevalent across the world, the country, and even our campus? Raising awareness and being able to talk about such an intense topic are the first steps to tackling such a broad topic. I want to bring a suicide awareness event to campus where we can have speakers to come talk about their own experiences, where people can come to learn about mental health, where our very own students can potentially find the help that they were always scared to admit needing. It is not easy to seek help, and that is okay, but if we can provide a safe space for people to come and better understand what they might be going through, then hopefully we will see that help is ready to be given, and as a result, things will look up. We currently have a club on campus called Active Mind, whose goal is to reduce the stigma of mental health by spreading awareness and education. I want to work with them to continue to get the word out. Since such a club already exists, it is clear that this is a concern on campus, and I want to make it a concern that is heard all around, because our students should not be dealing with their issues silently. It is hard enough being on your own in college and learning how to be an adult, and the added pressure of struggling with mental illness should not be taken on alone. With that said, there's a final thing I want to mention today, and that is the school's protocol for some, when someone is suicidal. Last year, I walked through the lobby of my dorm where I saw a girl sitting and crying, waiting for the college to decide how to deal with her suicidal thoughts. As someone who knows firsthand what this felt like, I knew that she was suffering and being exposed to everyone that walked by. This was not the way the situation should have been handled. Since public safety will not transport someone without their consent, it took hours to decide what they were going to do with a girl that was clearly struggling. Therefore, I think it is crucial to work with public safety and the college to put in place a protocol that will get the student in need the help they deserve and require. I'm currently thinking that there should be a place to bring the student, rather than having them sit in the lobby of a dorm, and if, that, if someone is putting themselves or others in danger, they should make the decision to transport them. This is only the start of the conversation. There is so much that can be done, but we need to start somewhere. I've made it my personal goal to eliminate the bad stigma, stigma people associate with mental illness and have a program that people are comfy, comfortable enough to reach out to when they need help. Everyone deserves a fair ch chance at life, and I want every person to know that. I want every person to understand that life is always worth living for, and even, even when it doesn't seem possible or worth it. The College of Charleston has already begun to enact change in order to help its students with mental health but we need to follow through and finish the conversation we started. It is time to support those who don't feel supported. It is time to make a change. It is time to save lives. It is time to start a conversation that so many people are not willing to have. If we can do this, I know that it can and will change someone's life. So will you help me start this conversation? Thank you for that, Jake. Um, so up next we have Sean Dolphin, and Sean goes by he, him pronouns. I want to thank you all for letting me speak with you today. <coughs> I want to begin a little differently, and I would like to ask that if you are able, will you please raise your right hand? I'm now going to share with you some quotes. If you recognize the quote and are able to name their owner, keep your hand up. But if you can't, please put your hand down. We'll see how many hands we have left. Everyone got it? Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. That is the interrelated structure of reality. There is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. <laughs> I raise up my voice not to shout, but so that those without a voice can be heard. We cannot succeed when half of us are held back. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> These quotes are from several incredible people. Activist and leader Martin Luther King Jr., writer Audrey Ward, a queer woman of color, and pa Pakistani activist Malala Yousafzai. These individuals are incredibly influential, 
each coming from a different background, presenting clear examples of how common ground can be established where our various identities intersect, and how we can use that intersection to cultivate and grow an era of acceptance. Intersectionality is something that I didn't truly understand until I began college, and was able to open my mind and realize the vitality of it. It's how all of our identities, whether that be gender identity, sexual orientation, ethnicity, disability, you name it, combine and overlap in order to create a codependent system of exclusion and oppression. This apparatus of oppression is not just rooted in systemic discrimination and inequality, but propelled by our interpersonal relationships and connections. Utopia does not come easy. Social justice does not solve itself. Not unless we are willing to make sure that people don't fall through the cracks. This is the nature of the intersectionality that we must inherit here at the college. Because you cannot fix racism unless you are prepared to fix sexism, homophobia, classism, ageism, ableism, etc. Each form of oppression is pulled from the womb of another. These voices I quoted at the beginning of this talk show that people of these marginalized identities can have a voice but that these voices are often muted by the system of oppression and social forces that allow this to prevail. We need to thwart this. We need to amplify these voices. We need to bring them our megaphones and our full attention and believe that what they say conveys a standpoint that may not be our own. I am a gay white man, and I have a standpoint that not everyone shares. People of color have a standpoint that I and many of us in this room do not share. Queer people of color have a standpoint that I do not share. Women have a standpoint that I do not share. Even straight white men have a standpoint that I do not share. The point here is not that we are unable to understand each other because of our standpoints, but rather that we can use our differences and lift each other up and work towards a new society, one built by the bricks of our differences and sewn with the glue of our empathy. Let's start here. The college is an outstanding institution, and it has made incredible strides to become a more sustainable one especially when compared to other schools in the Southeast. But we are far from perfect. We do have a campus community that, in large part, understands our issues and works towards fixing them. But I would be remiss if I said that our work to fully promote justice and equality at CFC is done. One particular area that we need to improve is how far from perfect our use of language is, and how we often fall short in our understanding of that language. This community uses language that is outdated and marginalized. It establishes boundaries and separates us into groups, the in and the out. We often fail to recognize how our words and our actions can impact those that fall outside of our norms. It's no secret that we have issues with racial injustice in particular, and I can attest that there are common, perhaps unintentional assaults on the agency of the members of our LGBTQ plus community as well. I distinctly remember when a classmate brought his friend over to my house, and how sick I felt when I heard his friend yell out, that's so gay. This is not an uncommon quote on campus, and we can no longer allow it to go unnoticed. We use language that we don't have access to. We use jokes we don't have access to. We attack people when we don't have to. As Audre Lorde puts it, use without the consent of the used is abuse. To combat this, we need to put language in the hand of these abused. I propose that we establish an online network of social sustainability to give voices to people experiencing oppression and microaggression. A first step in this is to create a website form that includes written pieces by students for students. Pieces will be edited, but at the core, it should be the words of the writer. These writings can be about anything. A member of the LGBTQ plus community could write about being called fag. A person of color can reflect on hearing the N-word screamed by white people singing a song at the party. A woman can discuss her experiences of sexual harassment while being a student. Anything, as long as they directly relate to an issue students experience while at the college. They should not be censored because the world and our community in Charleston is far from it. They should also be archived to preserve these voices. Furthermore, these don't all need to be stories of struggle, for it should also include stories of success and inclusion. Stories from someone whose friend helped her deal with a sexual assault, or how a person of color discovered an ally when someone else intervened in a racially charged incident. Presenting stories of hope can shine a light where we often fail to see it exist already. That us imagining a world without these discriminations is firmly within our reach. And in the middle of everything, there are ribbons of that light. Let's build on that. But we, together as a community, need to make this happen. It's time to stand together at the intersection of our identities and make sure that we don't let anyone slip through. If the College of Charleston Instagram account posted about any of these stories, 
that would have the potential to grow in both effective and practical ways to its 29,000 followers. And the more people that we can touch with these stories means the more that they will resonate with those that allow this culture of marginalization and exclusion to continue. I would also like to assemble a team filled with diverse students. They will be the members of what I would like to name the Alliance for Intersectionality. This group will be tasked with editing these writings, along with the website and online forum. They will create a plan for the future and use weekly meetings to complete these tasks. It will be a recognized organization with positions and an executive board, allowing it to continue for generations of Cougars, long after I cross that cistern a few years from now. They will also be tasked with planning and putting up a culminating event to take place each spring, entitled Intersectional CSC. This should be a fun event taking place in the cistern yard, and there will be speakers from the college community, along with some social justice warriors that make long-lasting impacts in the greater Charleston area. There will be colored ribbons to indicate preferred gender pronouns. There will be music, and there will be food, and there will be tears, both happy and sad. There will be empathy, and there will be intersectionality. College is supposed to prepare us for the real world. Let's lift up and listen to all of those around us, regardless of where they came from or who they are. We have an opportunity to hand the megaphone to those who need one and shape the world with our intersectionality. Let's take it. Thank you. Thank you for that, Sean. Um, I'd next like to invite to the stage Grace Hedrick. Grace goes by she, her pronouns.
I'm sorry that I couldn't remember to tell you no. But mostly I'm sorry because this will happen to somebody else tonight. And they will wake up in the morning feeling as though it is their fault. But I do take solace in these words. Because as I put pen to paper, I see that you did not take everything. Not even close. Thank God you did not know these people. Thank God they are still mine. But you're going to know me. I come from women made of steel and men whose hands have never done anything more important than hold their children's faces in their palms. My mother named me Grace. It means God's servant. So um, that's bits from a poem that I wrote, and it took me a really, really long time to write that poem. Um, but it even took me a longer time to be able to say it out loud. But ever since I started sharing it, um, I started to heal. And I really think that's the power of storytelling. That's the power of sharing the lived experience. So as I walk through the days and weeks and months and years since my assault, I have um, began to identify the strengths and weaknesses of the system, of our system here at the College of Charleston. Um, a major strength on campus that we have is support. So organizations like Victim Services, like um, SCOPE, counseling, partnerships with People Against Rape, partnerships with um, NUSC, these organizations help survivors transition from victim into survivorhood, which is such a beautiful thing. Um, but in all of my research and my personal experience, I've identified a serious lack of prevention programming on campus. Um, now, a lot of these organizations that I just mentioned do prevention programming. Um, recently, the Office of Institutional Diversity um, put together an event called Man to Man, which was largely targeting toxic masculinity, which is completely intertwined with everything that I'm speaking to you all about today. But um, all of the programming, I've noticed two large downfalls. The first is that um, we are missing a huge population, a huge portion of our male population on campus that just is not attending these events. And the second part is that I think we're lacking the personal culture. We're lacking the personal stories, um, which I think that's really when we change minds and change ideas. So my proposal um, is a three-stage intergroup dialogue circle. Many other institutions, like the University of Michigan, for example, um, has used this framework and it's seen really great success. Some of you, as Tanner mentioned, may know about the uh, sort of justice campaigns that happen on campus. That's a similar framework as well. Um, the one that I'm proposing, like I said, would be three stages. So the first stage would be identifying facilitators. Um, so these are, this would be identifying students on campus that have been touched by this issue. So um, perhaps someone that is a victim of uh, dating violence, someone that is a male victim of sexual violence, or perhaps even somebody that has been accused. Um, getting these people, hearing their stories, training them as facilitators, and getting them to help us lead this charge, help us lead these campaigns. So that would be stage one, identifying them. Um, stage two would be moving into intra-group discussion. So intra meaning homogenous groups. So these would, um, these would be people of a shared identity speaking together with the facilitators. Um, some of the groups I've thought about would be a group of victims, a group of perhaps people that have been accused, um, a group of LGBTQ members, a group of um, you know sorority sisters, a group of female athletes, and then of course a group of fraternity brothers and a group of male athletes, because those are statistically two of the groups on our campus that um, are at a higher likelihood of being accused or of perpetrating these assaults. Um, we would obviously go through these intra-group discussions with this constant theoretical framework of active learning, of structured interaction, of facilitative guidance, and um, we would share experiences in a safe place with the common goal of us learning from each other. So from the intro, we would then move into inter-group discussions. So this would be, this stage three scares me a little bit, but it would be grabbing people from all these different, it would be uh, grabbing people from all these different groups Having people from all of these different groups and um, having them come together and share the ideas that they had had in their intergroup discussions or sharing their personal experiences, always with the common idea that at the end of the day you get up from the table with a better understanding of consent, a better understanding of what sexual responsibility should look like, and a better understanding of each other. Um, but to do that, you have to bring everyone to the table. And I really believe, just as we can't pigeonhole victims into a single definition of victimhood, we cannot do that with the accused either. Um, if for no other reason, then we're effectively marginalizing them out of the conversation and we're denying them the education. So the part of the story, the part of my story that haunts me the most, the part that keeps me up at night, is that 
I don't even think he knew. I really don't. I don't think he knew that what he was doing was rape. Um, I don't think he was malicious. I don't think he aimed to cause me harm, and yet there I was. And yet here I stand. So you tell me where society failed him. Um, I think that this is why we're losing the fight against sexual violence and um, you know, dating violence on campus. Um, there are evil people on this earth, you know, I'll give you that. There are people that aim to do harm, but that's not what we're dealing with here. Statistically, that's not what we're dealing with here. Um, these rapists on campus, there are brothers, there are sons, there are friends, there are lab partners, there are boyfriends. I think there are good people that um, are doing bad things because nobody has ever looked them in the eyes and told them otherwise. Um, so, I recognize that I can't really promise you any solutions here today. I know that we can find progress in conversation, um, in the sharing of lived experience. So I can't give you tangible evidence that this in fact is going to work, but I do know that the solution doesn't come from statistics and numbers and pamphlets and posters. This has to be something that is second nature. Sexual responsibility has to be second nature within our students, and you do that through the sharing of truth. And the only truth that any of us can stand in is that of our own lived experience. Um, so I remember the light in the room. I remember the way that the room was lit. I remember the sound of my forehead hitting the wall in front of me. I don't ever want my little sister to wake up and feel the way that I felt that morning. And I definitely don't want my little brothers to cause anyone else pain simply because they didn't know how to wade through the gray area of consent. This issue is monstrous. It is intimidating. But isn't it time? Isn't it time to heal? Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Grace. Um, and I, I do want to just express um, gratitude for all of the students who um, were from a place of vulnerability and, um, and were willing to share and put themselves on the spot for a better world. Um, that, that is <laughs> um, so um, the assessors are going to convene briefly um, to determine uh, who first and second and third places um, are. Um, during that time, though, uh, we have a super special guest with us, um, Elizabeth Sturgeon, like the Sturgeon Oratorical, <laughs> <laughs> um, who is uh, Frank Sturgeon's daughter. Um, so um, Elizabeth works as the managing director for the Environmental Defense Fund. Um, and the kind of the business branch of that. So, um, so Elizabeth's going to uh, come up and uh, kind of share share her thoughts about this. And um, and yes, and then uh, we'll be back and announce some news. So, thanks. Can I hold this? Okay. Hi, everybody. I would like to introduce myself. I'm more properly known as Ginger Sturkin because I'm Elizabeth Virginia Edivander Sturkin, who's named after my grandmother's my uh, a good family friend. Uh, my grandmommy, Virginia, grew up here in Charleston. My dad, as you know, grew up in Charleston. Um, I wanted to introduce my family who is here, my stepmother Patricia Sturkin, my dad's wife, and Jean Wayne, uh, my stepsister. And um, everything went so fast, the rest of my family is arriving later, my aunt and uncle who live 
in Charleston also, and my cousin and his sons. Uh, I think we were all just so uh, shocked <laughs> at this and, and surprised and, and deeply, deeply touched. Um, I, I would like to thank College of Charleston and the Avery Center um, uh, and, and all of the faculty who supported Tanner. Uh, where are Tanner's parents? I was guessing that that was the two of you. <laughs> I want to thank you for raising him. such an amazing young man. Um, I've really been inspired by him, and it feels emotional because, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure Dad's looking down and just thrilled at this <laughs> and, and uh, excited that something that he did over 60 years ago can create change today, that some young man would take that and make something bigger than a train, make something even bigger from it with all of you and all that you're trying to do. Totally gone off my script here. <laughs> um, so I, I'd like to, um, to remark that I love that my dad was ultimately prompted to give the speech that he gave because the professor said, no, that subject is taboo. <laughs> the fact is, that we need more civil discussion of taboo topics that threaten to undermine our society and our world today. And you're doing that here today. I also find it inspiring that at College of Charleston, which my dad called Tanner, where, are, where is Tanner? He's with the Oh, okay. <laughs> you can't hear me gushing about him. Uh, he, he quoted the same passage from that speech, which is um, he, dad calling College of Charleston the most firmly entrenched stronghold of tradition in the country. <laughs> that in that college, in this college, you are engaging the issues of our time. That's inspiring. In his speech, Dad said, race relations are a question of right and wrong. Of Christ and love on one side, and Satan and hatred on the other. Discrimination is expensive, economically, politically, morally. Those things are still true today. He said, the whole issue calls for a new psychological conditioning. It will take time and effort. It will be accomplished, and my generation is going to do it. We young people are going to teach our children differently. We are not afraid to do so. Well, Dad did teach me differently. And a generation was taught differently. And yet we still face huge challenges. Racism, economic inequality, sexism, climate change. So I want to tell you how much it means to me personally to see what is taking place this afternoon at the Sturkin Memorial Oratorical Competition. I know that Dad, creative, <laughs> talkative, energetic, wonderful Dad, would just be thrilled at this. I work professionally on the environment, with why the climate change reference there, I'm sure you're wondering. Um, and I work with companies that want to um, with environmental issues and um, it's part of a national environmental group called the Environmental Defense Fund. I've been doing it my entire professional career over 21 years. Um, so this week was a hard week. Was it a hard week for anybody else here? <laughs> for me, it, you know what's going on politically. Well, it, it was hard for me too because there were two reports that just came out from international scientific bodies. Uh, that were really dire. Um, one saying that greenhouse gas emissions from things like plastics and fertilizer were going to skyrocket and uh, take away all the gains made by other sectors. Uh, the other one uh, basically saying that um, things are going to get much worse much faster than we ever expected. Um, and um, it will take uh, innovation and creativity like like it has never been seen before to address. So um, 
it's uh, it's hard because I, I know here in Charleston, you feel climate change personally in the form of hurricanes. I feel climate change personally in Northern California in the form of drought and wildfires. The worst wildfire ever in the state was a year ago. Um, it's just devastating and uh, it's, it's kind of depressing. <laughs> but you know what? I'm here today and, and I am hopeful. I'm hopeful because I see in my work major corporations like Walmart and McDonald's addressing climate change and leading the way. Even at a time when the federal government is stepping back from leadership and letting the rest of the world go forward. I am hopeful. I am hopeful because of the young people in this room engaging on the issues of our time. You have no idea how hopeful that is. I am hopeful because change came on segregation years ago. We still have so much more work to do. But change will come on institutional racism. And I am hopeful because we are addressing the taboo issues. It will take time and effort, but it will be accomplished. Thank you. So I'm not going to tell you who won yet. I guess one of the things that I was most excited about with this, this whole project is how many people came together. It's, I think people who are very in tune with our campus, so everyone in this room, um, know that it's, it's difficult to bring a lot of um, different people with different concerns together, um, particularly on our campus. So I was really happy with um, all of the support that, um, that came from across campus. So I'm just going to read out um, kind of the different kind of individuals and then um, administrative bodies too. So on our initial review panel um, sat Lisa Young, who is a new professor in English, Stephanie Arwater, who works in um, uh, new student programs, um, Jonathan Ray, who works uh, in the president's office, Alexis Wright, who's a political science student, and Simon Lewis, who um, is an English faculty member. Um, all, um, on our panel today, we have um, Alicia Cadeau, who's the executive vice president for student affairs, um, Julia Eichelberger, who um, is a Southern Studies and English faculty member, uh, Caroline Foster, who's a communications faculty member, and um, uh, sustainability literacy Institute faculty fellow, um, Tamika Gadsden, who's a local activist and leader with the Charleston Activist Network, um, and Summer Stanford, who um, is an English student in junior year, senior year. Okay. Um, so, so you know, these are these are some individuals who have seen this through. Um, there's a there's a bunch of administrative bodies. So the Avery Research Center for African American History and Culture um, has helped with the prize money. Um, the Black Student Union has helped kind of with publicity and support. Catering services, of course, uh, will all be indulging in a bit um, in the body. The Charleston Activist Network with um, Tim Ganter and with Broadcasting, the Division of Student Affairs with everything that, that, that they've done. Um, the Honors College uh, for broadcasting this. The Office of the Provost, again, for broadcasting. A lot of this is uh, getting the word out to people um, to apply and um, so the Office of Sustainability, who's filming back there, the Philip Simmons Foundation, who um, we'll hear more about that in a second, um, Physical Plan, who uh, is responsible for this room and in the lobby to set up for our reception, uh, PRISM, or the A Straight Alliance on campus, um, the Race and Social Justice Initiative, the School of Humanities and Social Sciences, uh, which helped with the prize money, um, 
Special Collections in the library, which I worked with Special Collections in the Avery Research Center to tell certain story, and we'll be working with them in the future, too. Um, the Sustainable Literacy Institute, which is helping with prizes, um, and then academic departments of African American Studies, Communications, English, Women's and Gender Studies, and Southern Studies. So um, yes, a lot of people are behind this, and that is really cool. I'm looking forward to seeing what what comes of this in the years um, in the years ahead. Um, so uh, I think w as I was listening to us talk about the speeches, we were all um, I say all all the assessors were um, felt very uh, impacted emotionally by a lot of the speeches, and um, I think that that's um, several students brought up like the power of stories, and I think that that's a very important takeaway for this that um, if we're talking and we're able to sensitize um, each other uh, to our lived kind of oppression and marginalization or just issues on campus, then it become, then we become a um, more unified kind of culture. Um, so I think that that's um, definitely an important takeaway. Uh, we, we do have, um, so we're going to have uh, four runners up. Um, the Avery Research Center just as in Dr. Williams is saying, just let me know as people were talking um, that they will be supporting a $100 gift for all of the um, competitors. So, um, so that's really cool. <laughs> and beyond that, it's, you know, all these ideas can be seen through. Um, and, and so we'll be working to connect every student with those, uh, those resources. Um, so with that, um, we have some prizes, some special prizes. Um, they're, these are engraved cross pens that say um, the cir cir um, inaugural Sturkin Order, um, class of 2018. So um, this will be going to everyone um, to thank you for your advocacy and, um, and I guess being in tune with what our campus needs. Um, so, uh, So, uh, in no particular order here, um, I would like to thank um, Jordan Mercer for um, giving us a bit about what it means to have um, true access to all the facilities on this campus. Thank you. Next, um, I'd like to offer my appreciation um, on behalf of you know, our campus community to Taylor Bose for, um, for giving us a bit, um, a bit of a different perspective on what it means to be a sexual assault um, survivor and how that can be um, a, a source of power for, for survivors. I would like to thank uh, Grace Hedrick for um, talking to us a bit about um, how we can generate some prevention programming um, around sexual assault on our campus and, and really shift the culture around that. Next, um, I'd like to invite uh, Jake Brown up to the stage to, um, to express my thanks for um, talking about what it means to have a mental illness on our, on our campus and how that, um, how that feels and how we can connect resources to that. Um, 
Next, um, so this so this will be our uh, second place, um, which is so e each of each um, each of the students will be receiving a one hundred dollar prize from um, the Avery Research Center. Uh, so this this um, second place will be receiving two hundred dollars um, for kind of for this advocacy. Um, so uh, talking about kind of an an online network. Of stories and how and how that connects um, our campus uh, in terms of again sensitizing um, sensitizing everyone to everyone else's kind of things that they go through. Um, so Sean Dalton. Um, this is, uh, so I'll tell another little story about um, the, this, uh, the, the trophy that we have in front of us today. So um, Frank Sturgeon was the recipient of the Bingham Medal, um, which was you know, something you would pin on. Um, I was thinking, how do we make a medal social justice E? <laughs> um, <laughs> and I was like, Philip Simmons. So, for those of you who don't know, Philip Simmons is um, a nationally renowned um, metal worker uh, who, uh, he, he passed away a few years ago, but um, really talking about making, um, making kind of building arts a truly, truly artistic. Um, and you'll see a lot of, around Charles <coughs> of the kind of ornate uh, shapes on gates uh, inspired by him, if not actually with his hands. So, um, so I contacted the people at the Philip Simmons Foundation, and um, Mr. Carlton and Ms. Rossi there were very helpful in um, meeting with me and how we could honor that. So, um, so we have a, a handmade uh, trophy from um, from one of uh, Philip Simmons' apprentices, um, and this this is kind of this is uh, to honor his contribution to our uh, city, but then also to uh, to express thanks to our first grade winners. So, um, you know, Sylvie, I am so excited to see um, what what comes of this. Um, I think, you know, I was in the Netherlands this past semester, and the way that they treat bikes is really, you know, they appreciate them and appreciate how what that means for um, access, but then also the, the general goal of sustainability and um, curbing on resource consumption. Um, so, uh, on behalf of all the people I listed earlier, um, thank you, and um, yes, first prize, Sylvie so Bell. stays with us, um, she'll be supported, uh, a, you know, a little bit um, in, in terms of So, um, so yeah, so Sustainable Literacy Institute, and, um, thank you so much. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, so um, the next part of this event is uh, a networking opportunity. Um, we have some tasty cheese and crackers and um, hummus and veggies out in the lobby. Um, so I, I encourage you to uh, talk to the people who, um, whose ideas you resonated with um, and figure out where else we can connect because there are a lot of places where we can um, kind of figure out where our passions um, uh, intersect. Um, we're, we're, you know, to quote High School Musical, we're all in this together. <laughs> uh, uh, whether you like it or not. So, um, so but, 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 I do, but I do hope that, uh, that this time will be, will be fruitful in that way. And also ask that these trees compose all of the things which are compostable, which is nearly everything on the table. Um, don't use a recycling or a trash can 
if it's not something that has to go in there. Um, great. I will see you in a few minutes. Mm -hmm.